In qualità d'operatore, tutte le meraviglie della complicazione industriale e cosiddetta artistica mi sono familiari. Qua si compie misteriosamente l'opera delle macchine. Quanto di vita le macchine hanno mangiato con la voracità delle bestie afflitte da un verme solitario, si rovescia qua, nelle ampie stanze sotterranee stenebrate appena da cupe lanterne rosse che alluciano sinistramente da una lieve tinta sanguigna le enormi bacinelle preparate per il bagno. La vita ingoiata dalle macchine è lì, in quei vermi solitari, dico nelle pellicole, già a volte nei talai. Bisogna fissare questa vita che non è più vita perché un'altra macchina possa ridarle il movimento qui in tanti attimi sospeso. Siamo come in un ventre nel quale si stia sviluppando e formando una mostruosa gestazione meccanica. In my capacity as a camera operator, all the marvels of the industrial and so-called artistic maze are familiar to me. Here, the work of the machines is mysteriously completed. All the life that the machines have devoured with the veracity of animals gnawed by a tapeworm is turned out here. In the large underground rooms, their darkness barely broken by dim red lamps, which strike a sinister blood red gleam from the enormous fishes prepared for the developing bath. The life swallowed by the machines is there in those tapeworms. I mean, in the films now coiled in their reels. We have to fix this life, which has ceased to be life, so that another machine may restore it to the movement here suspended in a series of instantaneous sections. We are, as it were, in a womb in which is developing and taking shape a monstrous birth. What I just read is an excerpt from uh, Quaderni di Serafino Gubbio, uh, or Shoot, The Notebooks of Serafino Gubbio, Cinema Operator by Luigi Pirandello from 1925. The monstrous birth or mostruosa gestazione to which Serafino is referring to in the eponymous novel is the birth of motion pictures or movies, the birth of what could be called perhaps, and I wonder if my guests today would agree, Pirandello's philosophical toy. So I have the honor with me today to have Professor Tom Gunning from the University of Chicago. He's an emeritus professor of art history and cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. Professor Gunning works on problems of film style and interpretation, film history and film culture. He has approximately 100 publications to his name with a focus on early cinema from its origins to World War I, as well as uh, wider cultural concerns. He's written about uh, still photography, stage melodrama, magic land, and shows, um, tracking of criminals, the world expositions, and spiritualism. He has written on the avant-garde film, both in, in its European pre-World War I manifestations and the American avant-garde film up to the present day. He has also written on genre in Hollywood cinema and on the relation between cinema and technology. I would like to just show two covers of his Uh, uh, monographs, the films of Fritz Lang from 2000 and D.W. Griffith and the origins of American narrative film. Let me just show those covers very quickly. One is actually the Fritz Lang uh, book and the other one is the book we're going to be talking about. Uh, Professor Gunning actually wrote the introduction to the translation, kind of older translation, but still valid translation of Pirandello's Quaderni di Serafino Gubbio. Welcome, uh, Tom. Uh, thank you so much for coming, for joining us for this conversation today. And my second guest is Michael Sirimis. He is an associate professor of Italian at Tulane University. He received his PhD in comparative literature from the University of Chicago in 2003. So we're all at home today for University of Chicago people talking about Pirandello. Uh, professor Sirimis' research focuses on Italian cinema and literature as well as the interaction between these two media at moments marked by radical shifts in 20th century Italian culture, such as the 1910s, 30s, 40s, and 60s. He's particularly interested um, in the role played uh, by film technology in the emergence of different strands of modernism. His book, The Great Black Spider on its knock Knee Tripod, Reflections of Cinema in Early 20th Century Italy, published, by, uh, published in 2012 by University of Toronto Press, studies the responses to the rise of cinema as mass entertainment in the 1910s by such influential literary figures as Gabriele D'Annunzio, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, and Luigi Pirandello. And this is the cover uh, to his book from 
which I will be quoting extensively today during our conversation. And we have Michael Subialka, the co-president of PSA. You already know him. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Okay. So, hi. <laughs> All right, so uh, Tom, I would like to start with you. Can you help us set the general stage for our conversation? Pirandello started writing uh, Quaderni di Serafino Gubbio, he said in a letter around 1903, 1904, that's quite early in the stage of, of cinema, in the history of cinema, right? And then he published it serially in 1915, then in a slightly revised version with a new title in 1925. What was happening in cinema in the world at the time? Well, of course, um, the first cinematic um, public showings were in the end of the 19th century, uh, basically eight, the very end of 1895 in Paris, uh, and uh, and then across the world in, in 1896. Mm -hmm. uh, so 1903 is, is very early, and in fact, I I suspect. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, uh, the cinema he writes about was not in existence in 1903. Uh, basically, uh, the date when he indicates he started the novel, 1913, mm -hmm. writing it to 1915, that is that is the key date for the history of, of uh, cinema. Uh, How so? Its invention. Because it, it's a date in which, number one, films began to be longer. Mm. Uh, films up to that point had generally been limited to uh, 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. Uh, after 1913, uh, they began to be often several hours and so had an ambition to kind of um, be more like a theatrical presentation and more like a novel. Uh, it was also the year in which intellectuals began to pay attention to um, to film and write essays on it, which we could talk about uh, shoot uh, as being one of those, one perhaps the most important but it was a year in which uh, many um, European intellectuals and a few Americans and, and uh, people across the world, uh, the Japanese, for instance, began to think about what film uh, represented. Uh, it's really a point of self-reflection. And uh, then also it is a, a period in which the kind of narrative structures of uh, that, that still exist in many degrees uh, in cinema began to really solidify. They they had been there maybe since about 1906 in, in, in primitive, I don't like the word primitive, but some <laughs> rudimentary forms. Um, but by 1913, they began to be extremely sophisticated. And there were a number of attempts, uh, for instance, in Germany and in France and in the United States and in Italy uh, to see, to make what they actually called art films. Mm -hmm. uh, films that would be in some way uh, artistic. Partly that represented the idea of adapting uh, films from, from literature and from theater uh, or operas occasionally, but also it was the idea of exploring what, what uh, films, what the art of film might be. What both it, by, yeah. by the critics and by the filmmakers. So if I get it, if I understand it correctly, cinema in the beginning was more of a kind of documentary kind of, short form, very short form of, 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 of story, sort of say, without a real story, more of like a snapshot of whatever was happening. And then there was the pressure around 1913 to become more narrative, to imitate, so to say, theater and and the novel and literature. That's quite right. But what's very essential is to think about that early period, mm -hmm. which I'm sure did inspire uh, Pirandello's thinking about cinema, uh, even if not the, the novel uh, in in its form, uh, is that the filming, early cinema, cinema before 196, let's say, is primarily about what the camera does. Mm -hmm. You know, so filming reality, but also filming tricks like George Millet's, uh, filming uh, magical happenings, and uh, and filming jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 camera is in many ways uh, central to that earlier period. And one of the things that's important about Pirandello's novel is that he he doesn't allow the camera to fade in the background, which many people began afterwards to do to talk more about actors, more about scenarios. But he's really fascinated in the act of filming yeah. and the, the act of, of being a, um, as they used the term at that point, they didn't call it a cameraman, they called it an operator, right. which is a term that both 
um, Pirandello uses and that his uh, translators use. Absolutely, and then operatore in Italian even has has that manual connotation. It's it's a worker, mm -hmm. like operaio almost. So it's a very kind of uh, down to earth uh, manual work that is being described by that word. Uh, so um, Pirandello definitely had a resistance to that kind of narrative. And I think, uh, Michael, you kind of make the distinction in your book when you write about Pirandello, Denuncio, and Marinetti, you say that there are two ways in which these authors uh, or writers, intellectuals approach cinema. And one is like cinema as an institution. And then mm -hmm. what Professor Gunning just said, cinema as an apparatus, as its own technical mm -hmm. apparatus. Can you tell us more about that and about how you position Pirandello at the time in, in this, the culture of cinema in Italy? Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. That's a, uh, it's one of my the premises of my book mm -hmm. that there's this distinction, and all of the three authors that I'm writing about address uh, the, this distinction. So Marinetti, for example, obviously, he he supports the idea of a cinema as an apparatus, a pure apparatus, to be liberated from how it was applied by the institution of cinema, which, according to Marinetti, was uh, really a new form of theater. Mm -hmm. theater without words and he was really averse to or he claimed to be averse to uh, older culture anything that came before right the early 20th century so the idea was to create something entirely different which would be the avant-garde cinema that he wrote about and that he uh, he and his uh, collaborators wrote a, a amazing a man short manifesto about even though they didn't really make much of a, a filming except one film uh, so the idea was to to um, to liberate it and, and and go for the pure thing, mm -hmm. and try it in different ways. Um, D'Annunzio does something si similar um, in the essay that he wrote about film, um, where he proposes a certain uh, portrayal of uh, Daphne. Mm -hmm. There's a painting of Daphne, and he wants to uh, that that he refers to, and he wants to uh, make that into a film. Um, and uh, however, he's more uh, interested in participating in the institution. Subscribes, mm -hmm. in fact, the most, if I want, if I can say, important or influential film from the era that uh, Tom uh, explained as the beginning of the lengthier feature length narrative film was Cabiria by Giovanni Bastroni. And here he's famous for having written the, the intertitle to that film, the, the captions, mm -hmm. the silent film. So um, he, it was part of his agenda to participate in something that was much more, that had much more um, mass, appeal, yeah. mm -hmm. even though I argue in the book that he kind of also does something a little bit avant-garde in he, the way he talks about the film in his essay. Mm -hmm. Pirandello, on the other hand, uh, is not radical in either way. He's much more observant of, uh, of, of the new rea or re the reality of modernity, which, as you very nicely put, uh, sees cinema as a philosophical toy for presenting uh, human experience in this in this uh, time period, mm -hmm. and um, he remains kind of neutral. He doesn't uh, say that the film apparatus should be used in a different way or that it shouldn't. And even though this is a very important point, and uh, he he seems to be saying that. Mm -hmm. um, he seems to be saying that um, there is another way to apply it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than the one that, as you quoted from the book, mm -hmm. represents Gubbio's view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. one of the distinctions that I try to make in this book is that um, Gubbio and Birandello should be looked at as a different. Absolutely, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, Gubbio is much more of uh, somebody who rejects. Mm -hmm. He is also more ambivalent than what he might appear in that particular uh, quotation. Yeah. But Pirandello, I think, is more neutral. He creates an narrator who is not omniscient. Mm -hmm. Unreliable, for sure. Yeah. Unreliable narrator has a lot of personal issues going on with the diva, Nestorov, and uh, Aldo Nuti, who was 
Diva's lover previously and what what she did to his friend Giorgio Mirelli. Yeah. So um, he's more neutral, but he does have Gubbio say that there are ways of applying mm -hmm. film in uh, that allows you to see a different aspect of truth. Yeah. Reveal some kind of truth. And uh, specifically, there are three examples of that. There's mm -hmm. a moment when the diva looks at herself on the screen and she's shocked by what she sees. Mm -hmm. And Gubbio kind of psychoanalyzes that, in, so to speak. He says that she sees somebody there in that image uh, that she doesn't recognize and she's trying to come to terms with for years now. Some kind of a demon inside her mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that she's struggling with. Uh, then there's the scene where he, there's a the moment where he says, in the midst of all this gloom, if it were possible for us to see ourselves filmed by that camera when we're not aware that we've been filmed, then we won't be, even be able to recognize ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And um, then there's a the third example, which is Aldo Nuti. He has a, a, a conversation with Aldo Nuti. Mm -hmm says that he saw the dailies and he didn't like, there was an extreme close-up of his face where you could even count the eyelashes. And he just didn't like that because it seemed very strange to him to see himself that way. Right. So in all of these examples, we can discuss the, the idea of the apparatus is pure, as, yeah. as, as like in the Marinettian sense, that it can be applied in a completely different way mm -hmm. rather than in this institution which is about devouring and mechanizing life. Mm -hmm. But finally, what I want to say about this is that Pirandello is more neutral about this. Absolutely. And we, can, we can talk more about it later. I think he's more neutral. I think that... I the film as a feature-length narrative mm -hmm. or this alternative application mm -hmm. are kind of parts of the same thing in a way. Yeah. They are just different applications. And I'm saying this because I'm reading the novel with respect to Birandello's theory of humorismo, humor. Right. That relents out. The there, there is no reality we can identify. Mm -hmm. Reality is only what we construct with our, with our best tool, which is reason. Yeah. And um, th when the diva sees herself, and Gubbio says she sees some something of hers that is struggling, trying to get out, that's another construct, a rational construct. It's an interpretation of that image. Yeah. And actually, it's Gubbio's interpretation. We don't know what the diva really thinks mm -hmm. when she's looking at her own image. That's mm -hmm. what Gubbio says. Gubbio says she thinks that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when she says that if we were, if we were um, able to see ourselves being filmed when we were not aware of being filmed, it yeah. would be so strange. Uh, uh, yeah, we would see different sides of ourselves. Absolutely. It's true. Yeah. So I think that Pirandello, um, he, he, what he does is he exposes the possibilities that film can have in terms of providing different perspectives on reality. Yeah. Michael, yeah. if you allow me from here, I can segue to the, my next question to for Tom, which I think connects very well. So I'll quote from your book where you write, in fact, on page 20, uh, Michael, that Pirandello sees cinema as an emancipated apparatus capable of collaborating in the search for essential truth. Because certain in film images, you write on page 201, are able to provoke introspection. And then to kind of to, to uh, wrap this claim up on, on page 19, uh, you write, not speed, beauty, technology, nature, future, or past, which were the interests of Marinetti, but contradiction, ambivalence, and irresoluteness are the things that Pirandello postulates at life's ontological principles of modern life in particular. So for him, the camera helps helps us expose the instability of truth. It helps us kind yeah. of glimpse through these various layers of reality that construct us. And I think that this really connects very well, uh, Tom, to your concept of the technological image. Can you tell us more about what you mean by technological image? And I, this is from the essay, Hand and Eye, Excavating a New Technology of the Image in the Victorian Era from uh, 2012. What is this technological image? What, is, what are its origins? How does it change our view of the world or ourselves? Well, it is a complicated issue because it has a long history and, and a technology. 
And basically what I mean to be simple about it to begin with is an image that is produced by by technology. I mean, when you say any image is technological, you know, you always have paint brushes or pencils or whatever. But here I mean something a little more and it relates very much to the term apparatus as it's mm -hmm. used in film studies. That it's not only the idea of a medium that is reproductive that creates an image, but a medium that has an interaction with the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, again, one could say any image has that, but here is something very specific. And if we think about um, the origins of cinema in the animation of uh, the philosophical toys, as they were called in the in the 18th century uh, and, and 19th century, which were uh, toys that made images move. Mm -hmm. And this, I always want to emphasize, this is a radical change that, um, you know, this is partly what Marinetti is responding to, but the idea, if we think of it not just in terms of modernity and speed, but that an image actually moves. And that means a number of things. One, that it has a kind of lifelike animation, that there's an idea of the anima, the, the, the life, uh, the term, which of course also means soul, uh, and um, and to have an image that has at least the appearance of animation, the appearance of life, is is a radical transformation. You know, obviously, you know, perspective, all all the visual techniques of resemblance are designed to to increase uh, verisimilitude. But here we have something else, and when we move into, and this is what. Pirandello is profoundly meditating on by making his hero the camera operator. Mm -hmm. and people often say this is the first film novel. Yeah. Um, there are some things before, but it's certainly <laughs> a significant one. But for the most part, film novels tend to deal more with producers, directors, stars, all of which are in Pirandello's book. But the idea of making the center, the, the cameraman, mm -hmm. the camera operator, uh, the 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 person who is at one with the machine with the apparatus yeah. uh, gives gives this um, book not only a unique perspective but a profound possibility to, to meditate on exactly what what we're calling here the technological image and the profundity of it and it's something that that uh, Michael explores beautifully in his book particularly with this idea of humor is precisely that it gives us a perspective, but not 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 the one of the artist, not the one of the drawer, not even I would say that of the photographer, although, uh, but of someone who's actually operating, who's doing something, who's who is as the novel keeps on emphasizing, uh, or that Serafino keeps on emphasizing about himself, is a hand. Right. And of course, the 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 title, uh, the uh, Italian title for forgive my pronunciation, Atura. <laughs> It literally we translated it as uh, turn it. Yeah. It refers to the fact, and this is quite important, that early cameras, or not even early, almost all of silent era, were hand cranked. Yeah. That there was a hand. And um, this is for Pirandello in the novel and, and for his narrator, it's a extremely important. Mm -hmm. It's not saying, I'm just a hand. Mm -hmm. But uh, he relates that to, to the situation of almost all workers in industrial modernity, that they just hands. This is something, in fact, that, that Marx says in, in, in Capital, you know, that, that uh, the workers become just a hand. He's no longer a whole person, uh, that that is his, uh, uh, his or her essential alienation. Uh, the other thing I want to emphasize there is the idea of the crank. The crank is quite an important element in the history of mechanism and it only comes in in the middle ages and it makes it turns a hand motion into a regular motion mm -hmm. into a motion that that otherwise we can't do you know or that is very difficult to do uh and uh and so this whole idea of life uh you know, which is the end goal supposedly lifelikeness of the cinema becoming or being due to a mechanism mm -hmm. is 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 kind of the central idea 
of uh, of, of Pirandello's book, in which, as, as Michael brilliantly works out in his treatment of it, involves, as, as he just said, this kind of sense of like the machine image, the technical image becomes, in a sense, not necessarily consciously, but um, a, a critique in the reality. It, you know, it, it begins to question it. And what seems to me so important in everything that uh, uh, Serafino Giubio says about himself is that he, there's a new dimension. Mm-hmm. It's not just the act, it's not just the event, there's the witness, but not just the, not the subjective witness of, of a court case or, or even of the traditional novel. It is a mechanical witness, which is going to capture things, in fact, um, beyond uh, uh, what, what we might think about if, if, if we we're looking at it uh, as, a, as a consciousness. Right. You know, the idea of that, you know, he's, he's shocked the, um, by the fact, the actor, that you can count his eyelashes. Yeah. Now, why is that? Why is that shocking? It's because we wouldn't pay attention to it. We might pay attention to expression. We might pay attention to its words. But the but the camera is, as Jubio keeps on saying, impassive. Right. It records everything. It records things that we wouldn't think of as important. And indeed, this is part of the, the critique, uh, the attack on both photography and film in the 19th century, is it's not artistic. It doesn't deal with the soul of the artist who always makes selections. Instead, it just records everything. Yeah. And everything is there. And this is important not only for the machine, mm-hmm. but for the viewer. So the viewer, you know, th- what what was kind of denounced as the reason film and photography could not be an art form became uh, for others. And, and Pirandello, is, he doesn't quite articulate it this way, but I think it's it's very essential. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the mystery of 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 the of the technological image that's showing something that is not being selected by human eye or hand. Right. It's being recorded, and there is a phrase by the the great uh, American, uh, recently deceased philosopher, who is a uh, extraordinary film theorist, too, Stanley Cavell, when he says, "What film shows us." It's what the world is like without us. <laughs> and that's kind of amazing. And I think that's very, very much in, 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 in shoot. You know, that this kind of, I mean, at the same time, there are other dimensions because, you know, uh, although he talks about himself as a machine, as, as Michael's demonstrated, uh, the, the cameraman, the camera operator who narrates the book is not a machine. He's constantly thinking about other things. and But he's also constantly coming up against this you know, nature uh, of of his operation. Uh, as, There's a as, lot of meta narrative, meta thinking about yeah. you know, and the work. Yeah, absolutely. So very important, just to kind of maybe put it in, in one sentence. You know, the point is that in this novel, we're aware of the act of recording, of observing, and then ultimately, because he constantly is referring back to it, what the viewer in the cinema mm-hmm. will. You know, so this is this is to me what the technological image uh, represents. Absolutely. This thing that is mediated by a machine and that will be me- remediated, as 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 uh, in in the uh, quote you read. I think this was part of it, making the point that you know we're capturing all this. Uh, the, the image of the spider that absorbs like a tapeworm all the elements of life, but it will be reconstituted by another machine, by the projector, and by the movie theater. And for the viewer, who yeah. is in some ways kind of parallel to the operator. Absolutely, I think uh, so, Tom. This this concept of the technological image and also the way you spoke of the philosophical toy, I think, is really productive, not just for our conversation, but for any kind of understanding of technology and media at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. So you said that why what were these philosophical toys that you studied like the thaumatrope little handheld devices that can be manipulated and it's, they're simultaneously uh philosophical devices because they make you think about life they make you think about the nature of reality in a certain way and at the same time they have the aspect of entertainment so these toys you said they already started existing around the 16th 17th century but at the time they are only accessible to the elite what changes with cinema 
and with technology at the end of the 19th, early 20th century is that these devices then become accessible to the masses. The mass also has access to the technological image, so to say. And what I really appreciate, and I'll quote from your article uh, on page uh, 512, is where you, if, uh, you value this new point of view that the technological image gives us. You're not Cartesian in that sense. You think, why can't we like so turn it around and say that this illusion is not really an illusion, but an extra layer of perspective, another perspective. And you write, the technological image allows access to thauma or wonder through techne, art, craft, or technology. And you claim vice versa, making us aware of and curious about technology through the experience of wonder. Why shouldn't this ability to see the superimposed image be viewed as a faculty, an ability, rather than a defect. And I think this is really where Pirandello's book comes in. Uh, rather than demonstrating a perceptual flaw, my produ production of this image through technology extends my experience of vision. We glimpse a virtual world. So this is kind of the beginning of virtuality, of virtual reality is there at the end of the 19th century with a technological image and not so much with computers. Our perception is open, you write, to new experience through technology. And then I'll quote from Michael's book on page 198, Gubbio endorses the cinematic medium in so far as it may assault the viewer, as you were saying, Tom, with unconventional images that are able to intimate human truths, otherwise suppressed by an illusion, illusory daily experience. So if before somehow these toys were considered any kind of, you, you're right, uh, Tom, deception, anything that had to do with dexterity, even juggling was considered as a kind of negative, devilish, sort of trickery. Now with the, with the con more contemporary technological image, we have like a turn of events. We have a more positive view of it, even if it's not endorsing it necessarily. And Pirandello is a good example of this uh, techno revaluation of the technological image. Yeah, if I could just um, add something here, which is uh, implied very much in what you're saying. The dominant view, if you pick up any history of cinema, any um, is they will say again and again, the motion that we see on the screen or or you know wherever is not real. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. Comes from a defect in our eye, yeah. uh, the idea of persistence of vision, uh, which uh, which is in fact um, incorrect. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's very curious about it is this idea that and and when they said called them philosophical toys, they were claiming that they would be useful to children or adolescents to show them how their eyes could be tricked. Uh, right. but, uh, but of course, uh, in, in the quote that you uh, read from my work, my point is, why is that a defect? You know, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, the Gestalt psychologists already at the beginning of the 20th century were saying, you know, it's not persistence of vision, it's not somehow something that the retina does. It's the way our mind brings images together to create a new level of, of animation and, and reality. But it is, you know, it is double. This is what's exciting about it. And, and Michael's book, again, deals with this, particularly in the idea of, of Perendello's idea of humor, that I, there's, there's a quote that I particularly love uh, that could be in, come from shoot. The great Soviet documentary filmmaker, Dziga Vertov, yeah, yeah, I was going to make a reference to that afterwards. <laughs> According to the term uh, uh, Kino Pravda, film truth, you know, cinema verite, in fact, uh, later on got translated. Um, so he was very committed to the idea that, that film showed us the world, showed us what was real. But how did it show us what was real? And in an early diary, he talks about the fact that he filmed himself in slow motion, jumping, and that when he looked at the film, he didn't recognize himself. It's something that, that is a theme in in in, uh, in shoot. People are not recognizing themselves when they look at their filmed image. And the point for Vertov, who's a great believer in the reality of cinema or the ability of cinema to, to bring us to reality, it's not familiarity. It's not recognition. It, in fact, it's a shock of of making it strange to the use of the term that the Russian formalists use, that realism is actually not where we recognize something and go, oh yeah, that's 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 real life. That's that's Absolutely. what I know. But rather that we suddenly look at something and go, oh yeah, that's not what I've seen before. That's Absolutely. something new. And this is um 
this idea of um, that Michael talks about of uh, the kind of juxtaposing of different images of reality, uh, you know, because it's not just one image. In fact, a very important thing that for the the, the Soviets, uh, Rodchenko, the great Soviet photographer and and um, uh, and montages said you know, the only way to show an image of Lenin that would be real would be to show many images of Lenin. <laughs> and I think that Stalin would exactly <laughs> the, many, yeah. the many images of Lenin. Yeah, amazing. So um, the Vertov, the Vertov uh, combination, I think, is also really productive when we study Pirandello. In fact, when I taught the, the book, shoot of the Pirandello book at the University of Chicago, I had the students watch the Vertov documentary, mm -hmm. Man, Man with the Movie Camera as well, because there too, just like in Pirandello's novel, the camera is almost like a protagonist. The camera is yeah. being filmed while, while it's filming something else. And I, uh, from what you said, um, uh, Tom, there is, also, the um, the philosopher, the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset said something very very similar to what you just said. In fact, that the machine or technology is not creating an extra lie for humanity, but it does exactly the opposite. It reminds us that even what we think is real is constructed. It it kind of it destabilizes our notion of reality, just like Pirandello wants to do, um, and as Michael also uh, writes in his book when he quotes the, the episodes, and he just talked about the two episodes of the of Vera Nestorov and Aldo Nitti or uh, Mirelli. Was it Mirelli who it was Mirelli who couldn't recognize himself? I'm confusing the names right now. That is Aldo Nuti. Nuti. Yes. yes, Mirelli is uh, Giorgio Mirelli is the, the painter painter who killed himself because she cheated on him with Aldo Nuti. Exactly. But who, these two characters. Uh, sister. Yeah. Yeah. But these two characters in particular, you talk about them a lot in your book. They kind of show us this this disintification with the image that is shown of us. And even today in contemporary society, we're so used to Zoom now in the meantime, but it's still strange to see ourselves and to hear ourselves on camera. It's like, oh, I don't reckon that's not me. Oh, I have a terrible voice. And it's we learn another version of ourselves. And Leo Marx, the MIT scholar who's you know, 101, I think now in, in his, the machine in the, in the garden book also wrote something very, very uh, adjacent to what you were saying, Tom, that precisely the, the role of the machine of this camera is to disrupt our illusion of reality, that there is just one thing as a reality. And this is probably what the technological image uh, does at the end of the day. And I think a positive reading of it is absolutely necessary. So far, scholarship is also is mostly negative when it comes to the technological image and uh, Pirandello's book, as if you were dismissing cinema completely. Michael, would you like to add something to that? I've been talking a lot. I'm so sorry. This is a fascinating topic. Actually, yes. Um... Of course, you can always say that the cinematic image or any photograph mm -hmm. leaves a lot more out than what it shows you. Mm -hmm. But you can also say that what it shows you is really what you need sometimes. And that's what happens every day now with all the violence that goes on and all the proof and the evidence that rests on the video cameras, more so than what people say about mm -hmm. it. Um, um, yeah. So, and this, uh, uh, I wanted to say two things in terms. Of, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted. I remembered one thing. In in your book, you speak of Benjamin's the optical unconscious. I think that connects really well to the technological image of which Tom was speaking. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about this. What does it mean, this optical unconscious, and how does it relate to Pirandello? Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. Do you want me to say that now or finish? You you can finish your point. And then. I want to say that uh, about that the idea that. The, there's something real in the image, in the mm -hmm. film image, that the, the fact that we have pictures that move. From a humoristic perspective, the, the, the illusions that we construct in order to, you know, explain our experience, to, our, to be able to make sense out of our experience, they, they are combinations of fiction and truth. They're never fully fictional or fully truthful either. So there's that scene that is rather enigmatic in the novel where um, there's a scene in the menagerie where Varya Nesterov talks with Gubbio and he tells her, look, it's terrible that the institution is using the tiger in this way. But she said, there's nothing you can do about it because 
the moment that the tiger attacks the man, she, the tiger has to be shot. Otherwise, it will. Um, uh, it doesn't matter, in other words, whether part of it is because he said everything is fake except the death of the tiger. That's what Gubbio doesn't like. And she says, well, yes, it's true, but it doesn't matter because the moment she attacks, she needs to be shot. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, she will uh, destroy the, uh, kill the man. So it's as if the way I read that scene there is as if she were saying also something cynical, but kind of wise in the neutral wisdom that also characterizes Pirandello or the Pirandello-like character who appears at the beginning mm -hmm. in the novel, in that in the fictions that we construct, they also have truth in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may be fictions, but you do have to suffer their real consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's truth in fiction. And of course, the, the real consequences that you suffer is that there are other truths that may disprove your own fiction. There are other fictions that you mm -hmm. haven't counted for. So I just wanted to add that to the idea that the image has reality in it, which is which is indisputable in a way. It's not just a fake thing. But now I want to. I, I'm happy to answer to your question. Um, for Benjamin, um, some critics interpreted those moments, specifically the one of um, Varian Esther of looking at herself and being shocked, as an example of Benjamin's optical unconscious which says that um, uh, the camera with certain techniques of cinematography, such as slow motion or extreme close-ups, can reveal things that cannot be seen by a naked eye. Like an analyst almost. Yes, and Perfect. that unveils other truths that we were not ever aware of. Hmm. Uh, and he relates this to psychoanalysis, that's why he calls it optical unconscious, and he says, that uh, the way that uh, psychoanalysis uh, makes us aware of the of the instinctual unconscious, the camera makes us aware of the optical unconscious. Mm -hmm. And the way that this was uh, interpreted by some uh, scholars was that um, it's kind of a, even though he talks against the aura in this paper, in this essay, it's kind of a revalidation of the aura because mm -hmm. they say that this, uh, this uh, optical unconscious that you find there is kind of a, 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 a repressed pa past mm -hmm. that it speaks that come back to life. In other words, it's some kind of a projector. You project into this the strangeness of the image, which looks uncanny because it's so close up or it's slow motion and it's not something you think you can actually see in real life. It you kind of project your own repressions there that. Mm -hmm and back and make the image uncanny. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to say there, that when I compared this, and I actually called that section of the book, not an optical unconscious, is not that it's wrong or that it doesn't happen here as well. But I'm saying that, it, uh, my main point here is that Pirandello is not really interested in the past as much, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he's interested in the here and now, clash between different perspectives more so than what it might mean for someone's past that's coming back or the idea of unrepressing. So psychoanalysis, like for example, has a goal, sets a goal, that of unrepressing. Mm -hmm. And you may never get there. Usually you don't, you just cope. But uh, on the way there through analysis, you learn a lot of things. And Pirandello is similar. Mm -hmm. But the goal in Pirandello is not to unrepress a, a past memory. It's to discover truth. The truth, that you, he says in the uh, essay of humor, that you can never actually s discover or experience except in death or insanity, which may be a little bit tongue in cheek because you, it's like saying you never get it. It's always some kind of a uh, interpretation or a portrayal of something that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And he's interested not so much in the past, that you can you want to unravel and you know set straight right. formally, but uh, in the clash that happens here, almost in a theatrical way, if you mm. if you will, since he's a theater writer, um, of the clash between the different perspectives. Right. And as Tom said, you see yourself, you don't recognize yourself, 
and that makes you question things in a different way than you had them before. So that's kind of the truth, the truth for the humor, humorist disposition. The truth is that, is that clash that always opens the possibility for yet another way of looking at it. Absolutely. If, if I could intervene. Yeah. Um, this is, I think, the one slight disagreement I have with you, Michael. Although I think we end up at the same place, so I don't think, it's actually a, a, an issue about Benjamin. I don't think that, I, I think that when Benjamin talks about the optical unconscious being like the the Freudian unconscious, yeah. disingenuous. Because I don't think, I think you're absolutely right. For Freud, the, the uh, issue of the unconscious is undoing repression and accessing the past. That's not what the cinema is doing, which is where I think we, we agree. But yeah. I don't think that was really what Benjamin wanted to say was mm -hmm. uh, that in some way the camera is 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 like an analyst in un yeah. undoing the uh, making the past undoing the repression and making the, mm -hmm. the past uh, emerge. What he's really talking about is what we were talking about uh, earlier: this way that the camera records things without selecting and without thinking about it. There, there's an amazing point um, in the invention of the daguerreotype, the first process of photography that was widely used uh, in the 1840s. Edgar Poe, of all people, wrote a wonderful essay on the daguerreotype. And he made the point that you can enlarge a, da a daguerreotype and find things you didn't know were there. Hmm. And he kind of says, you can do this infinitely, which, you know, he was wrong. You can't do it infinitely. But you absolutely, and, and, and people who deal with photographs as evidence of this trace of the real, know that they can find things, you know, there's the great example for me is, is uh, Give Me Shelter, you know, the documentary on the Rolling Stones, uh, where when, where someone was killed and he claimed self-defense that the person he killed was drawing a gun. Nobody saw that but when they went through the photographic record of the documentary film that people were making, they found it. And there's a great scene in, in that that uh, that documentary where where Mick Jagger is seeing this, you know, they're, they're showing it to him on a on a, a, a flatbed uh, editing machine, and he goes, "Oh my God, look, there's the gun. He 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 was, you know, he was trying to kill me. This guy wasn't just being crazy; he was uh, defending me." And so the guy, and it was used, of course, as legal evidence, and got the the person um, uh, an innocent verdict. So this idea of the, of the optical unconscious that Benjamin evokes, I think he's a little disingenuous in relating it to the Freudian because it's not really about repression. It's about not noticing, not selecting, not filtering. And which I think ends up yeah. serving your point, Michael. So it's not a, a crucial disagreement except for in, in what I think Benjamin was, was saying, which is his own fault, you know, for, for bringing it, uh, pull, pulling in Freud. I, I don't think that, that means that Freud is totally irrelevant here. But I think this issue of the past, which as you point out, is not what Pirandello is talking about, that really if we got Benjamin on the couch, he would say, yeah, that was what I was dealing with yeah. either. You know, it's, yeah. it's this ability of the technical image to record, and it relates very much to the discussion of photography that we get in um, in shoot of the photograph of is it his father, his grandfather, that, that the, the past becomes fixed Mm -hmm. in in, uh, in a photograph and in the technological image, which of course is not what Freud is saying. Freud is kind of wanting to, you know, uh, undo the, the fixation uh, on the past. Whereas I think the technological image, it's more ambivalent uh, as, as you do end up saying, and which I think is, is absolutely what what uh, Pirandello is saying too. Yeah, on page 212, uh, Michael writes, Pirandello, who is not Gubbio, and this is a crucial distinction to be made when we read this novel, is engaged not in investigating the repressed past traceable in any given image, but in exposing, as you said, Michael, the clash between diverse images competing to portray an evasive notion in the here and the now. One thing that I wanted to add about that particular image is that, it also tells us more about Gubbio because mm -hmm. when, first of all, in that conversation, when Aldo Nudi tells Gubbio, I didn't like myself, 
in such an extreme close-up because it, you can even count the eyelashes. He says, don't worry about it because it's not you, that's dead. It's an image. It doesn't mean anything. It's dead. Yeah. You are no, you're not that. Whereas previously, when I mean, I was expect, when I was reading the novel, I was expecting from Google to say, oh, yeah, if there's a part of yourself there that you're recognizing and it's different than the one you usually know. Like he says about Varia Nestorov, who gets shocked. And yet he says something entirely opposite, which shows that he has his own biases, mm -hmm. that he has his own approaches to things. And then we move to the conversation uh, about the, the image of his father, the photograph of his father, which uh, which is uh, which we talked about. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the thing about Benjamin, I agree actually. And uh, when I was reading this, I realized that the, really the, the main thing I wanted to, the main point I, I was making there is that Pirandello doesn't set the past as, a, as something to discover. Basically, whether it's Benjamin who, if Benjamin called it up to the unconscious, and critics quoted it and said, "Oh, that's what Pirandello is doing," but then there's the critics who interpret Benjamin in terms of his other essay, which talks about the optical unconscious also in terms of uh, some kind of a Proustian memory, involuntary memory, yeah. which then involves Freud again. But, uh, but uh, and yes, it's very clear. And, but I think that. That's not going on in Pirandello, right? Absolutely. I wonder then if, if uh, Barth's essay, the one about Greta Garbo's face, would somehow read well alongside the, the reading of, of uh, Varian Estorov or of Aldo Nuti seeing his face close up, being screened close up in the, by the camera. So uh, to go to another topic still related, uh, Tom, tell us about the book. How did you end up writing the introduction to the English translation uh, by the University of Chicago Press. The translation is old, it's from 1926. It's by C.K. Moncrief, who is a Scottish translator from what I uh, know. And I think he probably translated from French because he was a very important Proust translator. I doubt that he actually read Italian. So he probably used the French edition of this. And we still are working with that edition. So how did this, how did this happen? Right. Oh, I had a series with the University of Chicago Press <laughs> uh -huh. called uh, Cinema and Modernity. Uh, and I was interested in uh, publishing books that would deal with the issue of how cinema relates to modernity. And my initial uh, impulse was to have not only uh, historical and theoretical texts, but also artistic texts. Mm -hmm. And the first one I thought of was, was uh, shoot. So uh, it's so something you already knew about, something that is present in your field. People read this novel. Right. Appreciate and it. It's available in a kind of library reprint. Uh, but I wanted it to be available in, in bookstores. My own exposure to it, though, and it's kind of a curious story because it goes back to the idea of the first screenings of cinema. Uh, there had been an event in um, 1976 when I was a graduate student uh, celebrating the first successful commercial screening of films in the United States, which was uh, on April 26th uh, in 1896. And uh, at that event at the Museum of Modern Art, my professor, P. Adam Sidney, who wrote the afterword to this book, did a, um, a lecture which he called uh, Film as a Threat to Literature. And he was interested in exploring the way that literature adapted to the fact of film. Uh, and uh, and uh, his main example was uh, Pirandello's novel, which up to that point I had not heard of. And I was just fascinated, immediately went, found a copy of it. And then when I had this uh, series, I said, you know, I want to um, uh, republish this book. I want P. Adams to do an introduction. And, uh, you know, based on this um, brilliant lecture I'd heard, uh, it was interesting. My editor said uh, she didn't think his essay was an introduction. It was... You know, and so she asked me if I would introduce it. So I did. We did it as a afterward. I also had the impression, which was probably my fault, that she was going to do a, a new translation. Mm. Uh, uh, she didn't. She supposedly there are some revisions. Uh, I'm not even sure that they were substantial. I mean, uh, I think it was, was it Michael or somebody else. I think pointed out the the kind of scatological 
uh, description of the turtle crapping that in Pirandello was left out of the uh, left out of the translation entirely and was not put back in. So I've always regretted that we didn't do a new translation or at least a revised translation, even though I think uh, the monk, uh, Scott Moncrief uh, reads well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Surprisingly. Not terrible. Yeah. Uh, I might add, though, just one more thing. Um, when the this uh, date, um, 1896, uh, April, whatever it was, 23rd or 26th, I can't remember immediately, we just recently commemorated at Columbia University and, uh, and, and uh, I returned to discussing this earlier event in uh, um, because it's now 120 years uh, in um, uh, 76, and the fact that P. Adams, when when they announced the um, the lectures, it came in the form of something that imitated a newspaper and the original newspaper account of the of the showing of the vitascope, uh, uh, and uh, P. Adams said beautifully uh, at that point, uh, "Gee, if I'd known this was going to be my my lecture would be announced as." as uh, a headline in the newspaper, instead of having it called film as a threat to literature, I would have imitated the daily news headline that had just been recently there, which had been, you know, Ford to, when New York uh, defaulted, Ford to city dropped dead. Said I would have entitled this lecture, Lumiere to lit, dropped dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I want to indicate how much, uh, Sydney not only made me aware of the yeah. of the book, but also of this this way that this book was about how does literature, how does narrating, yeah. uh, how does a novel get transformed by just the fact of cinema as an entirely different way. Absolutely, of, of yeah. Things. As you rightly write in your article, uh, technology transformed the writing of literature. And this novel by Pirandello is very often studied from that point of view as like how cinema has influenced the genre of the novel, these scenes, these flashbacks that is going in, these little zoom ins into a character, focalization on a character that somehow that has to do with montage, with film technique. Yeah. But I have to add that I find this fallacious. Huh. Because almost always when people do this, and this is not true of Michael's book at all, huh. uh, they draw on a cinema that had not existed in 1913, 14, 15, huh. or that only elements of it had. So the idea of montage, hmm. and particularly the idea of the flashback, is just emerging in film at this point. So I don't think it's true. I mean, I mean, or at least it has to be nuances. What was really new was this idea of the impassivity. This idea of recording everything, this idea of the eyelash, you yeah. know, as well as the face, which is what I would say is different from Barth. Barth is talking about this kind of, you know, spiritualization of Garba's face. He's not counting the eyelashes. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Interesting, fascinating. So this is what happens among literary scholars when we're left alone. We need other people to collaborate, disciplines to mingle so that we don't draw the wrong conclusions from readings. Interesting, and yeah, now I think I would reread the novel and more in light of the cinematic technological developments at the time and to see whether that thesis is true. I kind of took it for granted because, yeah, you read secondary literature and you think if they're saying that this is imitating film montage, then I guess it's imitating film montage. But I agree with you, Tom, and this is partly what I wrote my dissertation about uh, in an article on Pirandello. The actual innovation of this book is the fact that there is a camera that is almost like a protagonist in it. And we see the workings of this camera. We see how it impacts human beings. I think that's so much more interesting uh, than, than like comparing it to any kind of film, film montage writing. Absolutely. Uh, Michael, would you like to tell us from your perspective, the book, how did you come across it? How do you teach it? Uh, it was very important for your for your uh, publication. Uh, you also concentrate much on, on the humorismo and the essay. But how do you deal with this novel? How do you present it to your students? We can't hear you, Michael. I think you're muted. And we still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect, okay. now it's working. Yes. Um, well, I only taught it once, I have to tell you. Uh, and it was in, uh, the class was taught in Italian. Mm -hmm. um, and it was they were very advanced students. So uh, we kind of talked about all these ideas. And they also read the, the essay on humorismo. Mm -hmm. 
So we talked basically about what we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm. yeah. In a more simplified way, yeah. in an undergraduate class, um, in a more simplified way, the ideas that I, I try to put forward in the book. Right. They didn't read any publications of mine, but they, uh, we talked about the novel in this way and uh, came across it when I was trying to decide what to write my dissertation on. And I realized that I was interested in learning more about futurism. And by having conversations with my professor then, uh, Rebecca West, she said, you know, think about other authors who uh, also deal with cinema at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I came with, up with the idea of um, yeah. Randello and uh, D'Annunzio as the main authors who have uh, very different approaches to to aesthetics, to what culture, what art should be or is, and and, and then to think about the ways that uh, that they differ mm -hmm. when with cinema, how they apply cinema differently from each other, but also the ways in which cinema kind of brings them together in their way of thinking because yeah. it inspires new ways of thinking about yeah. art and culture. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, can we finish this conversation, Tom, by maybe saying what you wrote in the introduction to the book when you write that Pirandello's novel is a neglected masterpiece of the modern novel, an example of literature renewing its sense of narrational point of view through engagement with a new medium. Would that be a fair way to conclude this conversation? Tom, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. <laughs> yes, we could say uh, not Lumiere to lit drop dead, but Lumiere to lit change and transform yeah, and, and, and find new things. I might add here a terrific book, uh, The Cine Poem by Christopher Wall Romana. Uh, does, uh, does this with, with French poetry, the way that French poetry didn't simply try to imitate film by, you know, montage of like effects, French poetry of the early 20th century, but rather to kind of think through how it was different, you know, how it related to cinema, but also did something else. Nice. And I think that's what, what uh, the uh, shoot does. It, it doesn't try to imitate cinema. It tries to think through cinema and get transformed by that contact, but also come up with something new for literature. Absolutely. I agree. Yes, absolutely, Tom. Because Pirandello, this novel in particular, as Michael writes, comparing him to D'Annunzio and Marinetti, he's neither trying to like glorify this medium, this new technical innovation to take it to this kind of uh, extreme eroticism of which Marinetti, by which Marinetti was obsessed, nor does he use this medium to kind of express old values into a new kind of language like D'Annunzio did. What he does, I feel, is, is he remains neutral and tries to think what can we do with this new medium? How does it change our perspective? How does it change the characters that are present in a novel, uh, reality, the, the, the seeking for truth? I think that's kind of what he does for us uh, in this novel. Michael, would you like to add something or we can, we can wrap up our conversation? I, I think that uh, we can wrap up because then I will go on in the <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it for a while. Thank you so much, Michael, Sirimis, and Tom Gunning. You've been very kind in agreeing to join us for this conversation. Thank you again. Michael Subialka, do you have a question, something to add? Again? No, no question. It's been a, a real pleasure, though, to, to be able to listen to two extremely um, learned people who have written so much about these issues and to, to have this conversation and think a little bit more about um, how we can understand this. I think, as you, as you rightly pointed out, really... Um, still insufficiently studied and insufficiently appreciated um, modern novel that really is at the threshold of this moment of uh, the birth of a new medium and the transformation of, a, of, a, of an older medium. Michael, that's our next project at the PSA, a new translation of Shoot with an introduction by Tom Gunning and a, a, a afterward by Michael Sirimus. How does that sound? <laughs> I might add that my hope when we republish this book which it suddenly it would be read by everybody absolutely I'm kind of disappointed that it wasn't quite the uh, effect that i wanted and the most pleasant moment for me in this um, exchange was when you held up i think before we were broadcasting your copy of it 
with all the footnotes. I mean, all the, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, well, University yeah. of Chicago yeah. students own this. I wanted when I, when I um, said, let's republish this. I'm very yeah. glad to hear it. We will do that and we will fix the prose, make it more accessible to contemporary <laughs> readers and have a really nice cover. It will be a good addition. All right, thank you everyone so much for, for joining us today. I am going to end this session by reminding you that we will have we will have, oh, here's a question uh, by John Welly. I agree with Tom Gunning that a new modern translation of Sigira would have been a welcome. Michael, it's a mission. We have to do it. This is <laughs> demanded of us. So there we go. on to remind your viewers on Wednesday, 26th of May at 5 p.m. London time, we will be having a conference organized by the Italian Cultural Institute in London and the editors, one of whom is Michael here, Subialka, um, of the new special volume, Six Characters as World Literature by the Pirandello Society of America. So please join us for this conference. I will share the link on our website. And then we will have the final meeting of the Pirandello on Air Initiative on May 28th, so two days later, where we're just going to exchange a few opinions uh, about uh, the relevance of Six Characters in Search of an Author and and it's 100 year anniversary that is going to be celebrated this year. All right, thank you again, everyone, and I will see you next time. Bye, thank you.